Welcome to a look ahead. We're excited that you've decided to join us. We're really delighted. We studied the books of um, the, the Sabbath school lessons are prepared by the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and this particular series we're reading. This is the first lesson in the new series on the Book of Job. That's going to prove to be very interesting, I'm sure. And this is lesson number one in that series, and we're going to have 14 lessons in this series, not just 13. It just so happens that it works out that way. This is the lesson for October 1 of 2016, and it's entitled, interestingly enough, Lesson 1 is entitled, The End. Hmm, that's interesting. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, as we turn now to uh, uh, a new series of lessons about the book of Job, that book which says so much about you and so much about the issues and the great controversy and so forth. Help us to grasp them, to understand them, and to imply them to our own lives and those around us as we have opportunity is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This lesson will start with the end of Job's story. Good stories always have great endings. That's particularly true in fiction, but what about reality? Does the story of Jesus here on this earth have a good ending? If Jesus doesn't come back before, before we die, then the end of every one of our lives is going to be what? Death. Is that a good ending? And even Job died at the end of that long life. But was that God's original plan? What was God's original plan? For us to live in Eden. For all of us to be living on forever and ever in the Garden of Eden. That's what his original plan was. Well, it's, God in, it's God's intention at this point that we evaluate our existence and value only in terms of, uh, is it God's plan? that we evaluate our existence and value only in terms of the life, this life on earth? Never. God looks at us as his children with whom he will live forever. Should we be taking that same view? In that case, our lives will have a happy ending. And what are we talking about? What's the happy ending? The never ending. Yeah. Never ending, happy ending. Yes. Well, many stories in the Bible need to be understood in the context of the larger great controversy setting in which they took place. We should never limit our focus of attention on just what happens on this earth. So our focus for this particular lesson, the ending, so-called ending, is found in Job 42, 10 to 17, and I'm going to read it now from my Good News Bible. Then, after Job had prayed for his three friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had, he had had before. All Job's brothers and sisters and former friends came to visit him and feasted with him in his house. Where, they, where were they when he was in the midst of the book of Job? They expressed their sympathy and covered him, comforted him for all the troubles the Lord had brought on him. Each of them gave him some money and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the last part of Job's life even more than he had blessed the first. Job, born, Job owned 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 2,000 head of cattle, and 1,000 donkeys. Wow. I mean, how many people would it take to, just to take care of that kind of a gang? He was the father of seven sons and three daughters. He called the eldest daughter Jemima, the second Keziah, and the youngest Karen Hapuk. There were no other women in the whole world as beautiful as Job's daughters. Their father gave them a share of the inheritance along with their brothers. Job lived 140 years after this, long enough to see his grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And then he died at a very great age. Is that a happy ending? Maybe we should yeah. read the few verses starting with verse 7, just before what you read, we'll too. We'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, most Christians have a general idea of the content of the book of Job. To many Christians, it is a book about why the righteous suffer. 
But these verses seem to suggest that Job's ending was a good one. And I, the one that really, the verse out of that whole collection that really raises questions in my mind is verse 11. All Job's brothers and sisters and former friends came to visit him and feasted with him in his house. They expressed their sympathy and comforted him, comforted him for all the troubles the Lord had brought on, them, on him. Each of them gave him some money and a gold ring. Now we know specifically from the book that Satan brought to all the troubles on him. Is that what they knew? No. Did they know who Satan was? But this should be, could be used as a key to understanding about that phrase, the Lord had brought or has caused such and such because you go back to Job 41, excuse me, verses, chapters 1 and 2, and it says Satan is doing it. So, uh, and then of course you get to verse 7 uh, that uh, they're not telling the truth about God. These four theologians are friends of uh, Job, which sound like a lot of stuff you'd hear in church. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, but Job, God allowed Satan to do what he did to Job. Yes. So in a way, God did cause it. Okay. If God had said, no, you can't, well, then it wouldn't have happened. That's right. It's interesting that when, when Job is rich and wealthy and everything is great, then all his friends do what? Bring him money. When he had nothing, everything was dead, everything was gone, he was stinky, you know, he was sitting on the dung heap, his wife said, curse God and die, where were they with their money then? They were trying to get him to cop a plea to something he hadn't done. If you got miserable friends like that, you don't need to be looking for any enemies. Okay, Myra, I'm gonna pick on you for a moment, so get ready. Yeah. <laughs> There's no evidence in the book of Job to suggest that Job had more than one wife. Imagine giving birth to 10 children, going through the experiences of having all of them killed at the same time and all the rest of that stuff with Job, et cetera, et cetera, and then having 10 more children. What do you think? <laughs> good genes. <laughs> yeah, good yeah. genes. Yeah, I, I thought life. about that today when I was listening to this and I thought, okay, it doesn't say that anything happens to Job's wife. So she has left him at some point saying, just go and, and confess and curse God. And, uh, Obviously, there was still something there, though, that she came back. Or was that culture? But well, to, have, to lose 10, I mean, we've had experiences in this community of someone losing a large portion of their family at once. And I know these people, and they are wonderful. They have not cursed God, as mm -hmm. many would think, you know, why did you do this to me? So I can understand that part a little better, but the wife coming back and having 10 more kids, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think Job and his wife said to the second batch of kids about the first batch? Mm -hmm. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, hope, I hope they said more than that. Yeah. Do you think they praised the first batch of kids? What do you? you try, I, I'm, I try to wrap my yeah, mind about, you know, we're used to raising a, sm a relatively small family. And, you know, we have sibling rivalry and that kind of stuff. But what if you do, we've got 10 kids here, and now they're all gone, and here's 10 kids, and they never even knew these other kids. Right. It seems to me when you look at the figures, even by today's standards, Job had a pretty fair size ranch. Oh yeah! yeah. And, wow, yeah. And I don't. And sort of feeding into the second time round. At least they would seem to have had good food, and uh, the comforts they would need to produce another ten kids. Mm -hmm. But you know that that takes time to produce that. It just doesn't yeah. yeah. just pop up that you have this whole herd and to have 10 kids and then to have 10 more, she's no youngster and... Well, this, this is people living much longer than Abraham. They're used to... This is, yeah, well, not he, much he, longer he, necessarily. Yeah. Well, but he lived, this, he lived years 140 years after. years after. Yeah, and he must have been 70 years or so 
when these events happened. At least. So At least. he yeah. must, the, his total lifespan had to be somewhere around 200 years. Or more. Easily. Yeah. Minimum of 200, probably. Wow. I don't know. I just kind of look at her and kind of go, you got a better <laughs> body than I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you think when they talked about the first 10 kids, did they mourn or did they celebrate? Well, they certainly mourned their loss at the time. Yes. yes. So, yeah, when are we talking about? Is this... Well, obviously, we're talking about in, in, in the presence the of the second ten. I would say they celebrated. I think so. Yeah. Uh, Just looking at Job's mm -hmm. response to all this and how he would teach his second bunch. Yeah. There are a lot of biblical characters who had very unhappy endings to their lives. Think about Abel, Uriah, Eli. I mean, the references are, and you can get our handout if you like. It's uh, 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 on the, our website at theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. All the references are there. King Josiah, John the Baptist, Stephen, Paul, even the disciples of Jesus. The only one of them that we know for sure lived to old age was John. And they tried to cook him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. We we know nothing about Job's brothers or sisters. No. Or his parents. No. Why? Nothing about his grand his children grandchildren. Well, we know about his children. Nothing about his grandchildren great child grandchildren except they existed. Yeah. And mentioned. Where, where is the community? Where is the Job community? Mm -hmm. At the time of at the time of Moses or later. Why, why didn't they, why weren't they a big nation? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you would think that Job would stand up shoulder to shoulder with Abraham, maybe even Moses. Do we have any idea when Job lived? I think he's probably, in our series, he's probably going to go back and talk about the first couple of chapters and maybe some say some things about when Job lived. Do we know anything about that? Well, by the length of his life, he probably was quite a bit before Abraham. Well, at least, I think most scholars would say uh, at least before Moses. Maybe the times of Abraham, possibly before. And there's a number of reasons why they say that, so we'll, we'll get into those later. But sometime after the flood, probably. Yeah. Now we're talking about the end of the story of Job. Why, why is there this emphasis on the three daughters as opposed to the seven? Seven sons are not even named. But here's the, the daughters are mentioned. It, 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 there, it says specifically they received an inheritance along with their brothers. Certainly he had plenty of money and plenty of things to give them, so there wasn't any problem with that. Do you think, do you think Job had any scars from his experience to show his second batch of kids? It didn't wipe out his reproductive capacity anyway, it sounded like. I have just one place where I had boils and the scar is still there and uh, yeah. yeah, he had them all over his body. Well, our Bible study guide suggests that perhaps Job never learned of the reasons behind all the calamities that happened to him. I would take issue with that. In light of the kind of communication, we're going to talk about this later, right now, because we're going to, I'm sure we're going to go into it in more detail later. And in light of the kind of communication that Job had with God before that whole experience, that is how he got to be, have that kind of relationship with God as described in Job 29 particularly, Job must have learned the truth about the whole story after it was over. I don't, when God started communicating him with him again, what would Job's first, first question be? What happened? Uh, yeah, why did this happen? How else would we have the record? Do you, think, do you think possibly either Abraham or maybe even Moses, both of whom lived out in the eastern part of there, which we think is the area where the land of Uz was located, you think it's possible that either one of them ever met Job, knew him, talked to him? We, we don't know. If God was willing to inform us of the issues that were involved even at the beginning of the book, 
Why wouldn't he have told Job after it was over? Because it would have spoiled the whole thing if he told him before. So I, I don't think he, I'm sure Job didn't know before it all happened. But afterwards, why couldn't God tell him? You're saying this was a social experiment and uh, it would ruin if there was an informed consent? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think so. Were there any un incomplete, unanswered, and unfulfilled questions or ideas or events in, in this book? It certainly continues to raise questions in people's minds. Well, another thing that particularly involves those of us who like to enjoy reading the writings of Ellen White, serious Bible students among those have compared the trials of Job with the final events in the life of Christ and with the final experiences of the 144,000 just before the second coming. There are many obvious parallels. We'll get a chance to talk about them later. So you out there, we would challenge you to think about it. The events in Job's life, the events at the end of Christ's life, and the events connected with the 144,000 at the end of this world's history. See what parallels you can think of. These were critical points, critical times in the great controversy. In each case, the devil loses. Do you think he was, is happy about that? No. Well, in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5, we read, So you should not pass judgment on anyone before the right time comes. Final judgment must wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light the dark secrets that expose the hidden purposes of people's minds, and then all will receive from God the praise they deserve. Is it true that everybody's going to get what they deserve? No. No, it's not true. Everybody who goes to heaven will not, will not get what they deserve. That's right. They will get way more than they deserve. And how does that fit with this passage in 2 Timothy 3.12? Everyone who wants to live a godly life in union with Christ Jesus will be persecuted. How does that fit? Well, we spend a lot of time in this class, obviously, talking about the Bible and biblical history. What's different about biblical history than just ordinary history? Is there anything, is just different kind of people who wrote it, or what's different about biblical history? Biblical history is telling the story of God. Oh. How God has dealt with us down through the ages, how he's tried to make us his own people, and how we've rejected him. Mm -hmm. Well, the biblical story then is, has an, biblical stories, I guess we should say plural, from beginning to end, has an intentional purpose, and that purpose is to teach us about God. More than that, we need to recognize that biblical stories can inform us not only about the past and possibly the present, but also about the future. The Bible can speak authoritatively about death, judgment, heaven, and even hell. And hell would be what to a, to a conservative Christian? Where does hell take place? Where does hell take place? Where, where will hell take place? In reality, it's people cease to exist. Right here. Yeah. This earth is going to be, hell. it's also going to be the new, the new heaven and the new earth. So hell and heaven are going to be the same place, just different times. Right? I hadn't really thought of it that way, but yes. In light of all that, what do we learn from a quick overview of the book of Job? Is there any hint that Job had an idea of why all that happened to him back before it happened? I think it struck him like a bolt of lightning. Well, what about this verse close to the middle of the book, Job, Job 19, 26, and I'll read 27 as well. Even after my skin is eaten by disease, while still in this body, I will see God. I will see him with my own eyes, and he will not be a stranger. 
What do you think Job had in mind? You think he was thinking about his personal experiences with God in the past, which he expected to resume at some point in time? Or is he talking about the second coming? By the way, would Job be an appropriate candidate to be among those who are resurrected at the resurrection of Jesus? I would think so. He, w he obviously wasn't buried near Jerusalem. I don't know whether you have to be buried near Jerusalem to be among that group. Well, how much information did Job have? Did he go to Sabbath school class every week? Did the pastor preach about the second coming? Well, his three friends, or three, <laughs> three friends that he had, they, they, uh, what they were preaching was quite similar to what you can get on many other places today. And of course, they were wrong. Because mm -hmm. Job 42, 7, you guys are not telling the truth about God. Mm -hmm. You aren't implying that preachers today tell things that aren't true about yeah, God, are yeah, you? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. We know, <laughs> okay, it's pretty as regularly. As far as we know, he didn't have access to prophecies that we have today. How much of the Bible was written in Job's day? None. No. None. None. The, Job was probably one of the very first books written. It was written by Moses. Okay? So how much did Job have to, available to him to read? Nothing. Did he have a church to go to? No. He was Probably the, not. Huh? Probably not. Well, I but mean... Th those three friends, you know, were theologians that were there with him. Yeah, well... He could be classed with the Romans 2, 14, and 15 uh, crowd. Mm -hmm. Those who do not have the law shows what the law is, is written on their hearts. They do what the law requires, and that is love. So... Job had no idea about the prophecies in Daniel, Revelation, Zechariah that we read and study all the time. Look at just a couple of those. Remember Daniel 2, verse 44? At, that, at the time of those rulers, the God of heaven will establish a kingdom that will never end. It will never be conquered, but will completely destroy all those empires and then last forever. Isn't that what we want? And look at, uh, look at chapter 7, verse 18. And this people of the supreme God will receive royal power and keep it forever and ever. So it was pretty clear in Daniel's mind, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that um, there's going to be a resurrection. There, we're going to go on living forever, right? How did, so how did Job get his information about God? Spirit of Truth must have been working. The Holy Spirit must have worked with him very directly. So he didn't get it by any of the conventional ways that we talk about. He didn't get it from church, nope. from preachers, from reading the Bible even. He could only get it from nature or talking directly with God or angels. Mm -hmm. The great plan of redemption, I'm now reading from uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 342. The great plan of redemption results in fully bringing back the world into God's favor. All that was lost by sin is restored. Not only man, but the earth is redeemed to be the eternal abode of the obedient. For 6,000 years, Satan has struggled to maintain possession of the earth. Now God's original purpose in its creation is accomplished. Quote, the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever, Daniel 7, 18. So the good news that we can read this story, read into this story, is that Job's death is not the end of Job's story. What's the good news? We're going to get to meet Job someday if we make it into the kingdom. And we can ask him about what happened to him. There's a apocryphal story that this reminds me of. There was a gentleman who lived a, in a place, uh, there's a place, Johnstown in Pennsylvania, that had seemed to have floods every 17 years, and he had lived through two or three of them, and one of them was really bad. And he, after that happened, and he barely survived, he, anybody whose ear he could get, he wanted to tell them about the Johnstown flood. And so 
according to this apocryphal story, he died and went to heaven. And when he got to the uh, pearly gates, uh, St. Peter said, well, welcome. Uh, what can we do for you? Well, oh, he said, I would like most of all to have everybody gather around and let me tell them about the Johnstown flood. And St. Peter says, I, I think we can arrange that. So everybody's gathering, and they're gathering, and they're gathering, and finally, guys go, he's getting so excited because he's the biggest crowd he's ever had to hear his story. This is really great. And he gets, re gets ready to go up front, and the St. Peter says, uh, you see that man with the long beard in the front row? His name is Noah. <laughs> 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 he has a story about a flood, too. <laughs> he mean, they had done that. A flood, too. Well, what, 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 do you think would jo what do you think Job will say about his life experiences when we ask him about it? Do you think he'll want to talk about how he talked to God before his experience? Will he want to talk to us about what happened to in those terrible days? But he want to talk to us about what happened to him afterward and how he communicated with God after that experience. What do you think Job knew about the great controversy? Now, Adam and Eve were told about the great controversy somewhat by angels who came and talked to them in the Garden of Eden. Did that information get passed down? What about Noah, how much did Noah know about the great controversy? Well, and, and maybe maybe Job did know some about it. Maybe God or the angels told him about it. Yeah. Look at Job 14, 14 and 15. If people die, now this is, uh, I believe this is Job speaking here. Let's just make sure. Uh, let's see. Yes. 12, 13, 14 are Job. Yeah, okay. Okay, we go back to Job 14, 14 and 15. If people die, can they come back to life? But I will wait for better times. Wait till this time of trouble is ended. Then you will call, and he's speaking to God, then you will call and I will answer. And you will be pleased with me, your creature. What does that tell us? Did he have a future hope? He knew God was the creator. Well, living in our day, we have definite proof that there will be life beyond death. The life, death, and ministry of Jesus are our guarantee of the possibility of a future life. And this is a comment in a, one of the commentaries. The New Testament teaches that Christ has defeated death, mankind's bitterest foe, and that God will raise the dead to a final judgment. But this doctrine becomes central to biblical faith only after the resurrection of Christ, for it gains its validity in Christ's triumph over death. Well, think of the story of Lazarus as recorded in John 11. What do we know about that story? Where was, this is very near the end of Christ's life and his, of his ministry. Where was he teaching and preaching during this at that time? Remember? He was teaching and preaching on the other side of Jordan in Perea to, to keep himself away from the Sadducees and the Pharisees, especially the Pharisees. But when they called him, when Mary and Martha sent that messenger to call Jesus, he certainly knew, Jesus knew very well, that when he traveled to Bethany to console the two sisters and then ultimately to raise Lazarus back to life, he was sealing his own fate. Why was that? Well, the Pharisees had opposed Jesus almost from the beginning of his ministry, but the Sadducees had not been too concerned about him. However, the Sadducees did not believe that it was possible to rise from the dead, and thus they believed that there would be no future life. When Jesus raised Lazarus just a few miles from Jerusalem and in the view of so many witnesses, it challenged one of the most cherished ideas. Suddenly, they were just as anxious to get rid of Jesus as the Pharisees were. Nevertheless, in light of all that, knowing all that, Jesus said to Martha, what? 
in John 11, 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will live even though they die, and all those who live and believe in me will never die. Hold on just a minute. Aren't all the disciples dead? What's he trying to tell us? Obviously not something about this life. Okay. If they're all dead, it's got to be another mm -hmm. life we're talking about. How does God look at our lives? Does he see the, oh, oh dear, oh dear, he's about to die, that's it, it's all over? No, God looks at our lives in, in, in terms of eternity. What happens to us here on this earth is just that much at the beginning. See, the, the rest of the fact that we might die at some point, if we die at 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or 100, that's no big deal to God. He, if we're on his side, he plans to raise, raise us up and we go on living. So think of the answers the New Testament gives to challenging issues and questions raised by the Old Testament. What understanding would we have of the Old Testament sacrificial system without the New Testament, especially the book of Hebrews? Does this suggest that God believes in present truth what do we mean when we say present truth? We used to publish a magazine entitled Present Truth. What does that mean? Does anybody ever, pre ever, ever, ever print a magazine called Old Truth? Future Truth. <laughs> what do we mean when we say present truth? Truth as we know it now. Something that's relevant. Something that's true. Today. Okay. Um, we have not only the Bible, we have all the writings of Ellen White. And through continual study of those books, and we, can, we have, it's possible to have a continuing revelation. Ellen White said these words, the redeemed throng will range from world to world and much of their time will be employed in searching out the mysteries of redemption. And throughout the whole stretch of eternity, this subject will be continually opening to their minds. March 9, Review and Herald, Sabbath, uh, Review and Herald, March 9, 1886. What do you think she meant by that? Well, it's interesting that education, almost every type of education, is a continual building on information learned earlier. You know, some of the great scholars in the past, the great inventors of ideas and so, so, so forth, have said, I only am able to stand up here because I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, right? We know, I mean, think about math, for example, and, and, and science. Every, you know, you, can't, you have to take algebra before you go to geometry, before you can go on to advanced math, before you can go to calculus. What would you, know, what, what would you do with a calculus class if you never had, it, had learned how to add and subtract? I mean, it would be just completely ridiculous. It would, it would mean absolutely nothing to you. So progressive education means you build on what was there before as you move forward, right? Is that any, does that give us any clues about progressive revelation? You aren't are, suggesting that we're in first grade math, are you? Well, I hope we're not in first grade math. The question really is, is there more truth to be discovered? Absolutely. Is there more to be learned? If we're going to spend the rest of eternity thinking about, talking about, discovering new things about the plan of salvation, what should we be doing now? It's interesting to note, if you look carefully, there's no hint in the Old Testament that there was ever going to be more than a single coming of Jesus Christ, the first coming. There, they had no information that there was going to be a second coming or other comings. Well, we know, however, that in places like, Ze like Zechariah 12 and 14, there are things hinted about that we, we tend to say, well, those things will happen at the third coming. But there's no hint in the Old Testament that that was going to be a third coming. Um, 
Jesus, but uh, so there is nothing to suggest in the Old Testament itself. In the New Testament, up through Revelation 19, there's nothing to suggest that there will be anything beyond the second coming of Jesus. And then what do we learn in Revelation 20? Millennium. The millennium. How, how long is a millennium? A thousand years. A thousand years. And then what's going to happen at the end of the thousand years? A third coming, right? John was told about a third coming after the thousand years of the millennium. Why do you think God didn't tell the people in the Old Testament about the second coming and the third coming? Why didn't he tell the people in the New Testament about the millennium and the third coming? Are these examples of progressive revelation? What do you think? They might have been quite discouraged if they'd known that there had to be several comings and they weren't just looking for the one that might be around the corner. Well, he was willing to tell John and John wrote it down and everybody could read it in those days. They didn't know it was going to be 2,000 years away. No, they didn't. Or more. Well, coming back to the reality of the lives that we live in our day, how do we relate to unhappy endings? Are any of those unhappy endings God's intentions for us? Of course not. It was God's plan for us, as we've already mentioned, to all of us should be living in the Garden of Eden. Is it ever the work of Christians to help others who are going through unhappy endings? Can you think of an unhappy ending? One of our usual members here just found out today, I guess, that her mother was, had passed. That's an unhappy ending. Yeah. Um, I can relate to that. About a year and a half my, ago, my father died. And my mother's in the hospital. They lived long lives, 93 and a half years and 95 years. Well, as we work, through our, work our way through the book of Job, we will discover that there are several very important lessons that Job learned. That's an really good thing for us to think about. Did his friends learn anything? What do you think? I hope do we they live long enough to see them. What? <laughs> I hope they live long enough to see that. Yes. Do we have any evidence that they learned anything? Any of them? They came and celebrated all the evils that God had brought upon yeah. Job. Yeah. Not celebrated it, commemorated it, whatever. Well, here's a question. His friends were absolutely certain that he suffered all this because of what? He had sinned. He had done some terrible sin. When he's all of a sudden now got all those animals and he's the richest man in the East, did they come and ask him what wonderful thing he'd done? He must have confessed. He must have? No. no it, it was perfectly obvious that he'd done something wrong because he was ill. Huh? And his fortune was gone too, and and his family. So, I mean, it's perfectly obvious. It's the same thing you can hear from a pulpit today. So I, I want to know: Did they come and sit around for seven days, watch him quietly, and say, "What wonderful thing now did you do? Now that you're prosperous again?" Oh, I don't think so. I think they were hightailed <laughs> out of there. Why not? <laughs> it didn't fit their paradigm. Well, <clears throat> they were the scholars. <laughs> They were the scholars, I see. Been to seminary, yeah. <laughs> um, but, of course, the book of Job is about much more than just material prosperity. What, what would Job tell us if we could ask him right now? What did you learn from that experience? That's a, that's a challenge, isn't it? Yeah. He trusted God, okay? One thing he says here in, in chapter 10, verse 11, he says, Thou hast granted me life and steadfast love. Thy care has preserved my spirit. But he's, he knew he recognized love there in, in, in verse 12 of chapter 10. Okay. Um, there's an interesting verse here in... If I'm not mistaken, it's chapter 
at 12 verse 9 Uh, no. What is it? Who among all those, all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this, and this, and in his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Yeah. Job is talking there. Yeah. Where's the verse that he says, if God didn't do it, who did? Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's in here. We'll come to it. That's he says in verse 23 of, ch of chapter 12, he says, He makes nations great and he destroys them. He enlarges nations and he leads them away. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, I think it's fair to say, despite everything that happened to Job, his one biggest concern was his relationship to God. Um, mm. Not to mention any particular people by name, but do you know anybody who has that kind of concern in our day? They care most of all about their relationship to God. Well, you could go down to chapter 13, verse 15. Mm -hmm. Behold, he will slay me, I have no hope, yet I will defend my ways to his face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Would you be willing to give up your car, your house, even your possessions, even your children, rather than giving up your relationship with God? I mean, these are the kind of questions we, I think we need to ask ourselves about the book of Job, since we're diving into it now. If Job were alive today and you asked him about the whole experience, what do you think he would say? We've asked that a couple times now. Um, and what it, the, the ending comes after God answers to Job, God's answers to Job in chapters 38 to 41. What was the purpose of all of that? Out of the storm, the Lord spoke to Job, it says. How did that happen? Have you ever tried to imagine, would, did God's voice just thunder out of a cloud, or what happened? It was kind of a counter to the speculation on the part of Job and the other guys. He was he finally said, hey, you know, there's a lot more going on that you guys have, have to learn, but it's mm -hmm. not. Yeah, okay. Prog progressive revelation and pro progressive perception. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, certainly in those chapters 38 to 41, he emphasizes his creative ability. He emphasizes his sovereignty. He emphasizes his power over everything on this earth, right? Have you ever thought about how you would feel if God suddenly appeared to you and gave you a message like that? How would you respond? Well, look at how Job responded. We'll get to this eventually, but just to look at it briefly now. Look at Job 42, verses 2 through 6. I know, actually we probably should read verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord, I know, Lord, that you are all-powerful. So he's learned that lesson, right? That you can do everything you want. Isn't it pretty clear in verses, I mean, chapters 38 to 41? You ask how I dare question your wisdom when I'm so very ignorant? Hmm. Who were the ignorant ones <laughs> in the Job experience? <laughs> it wasn't Job. I talked about things I did not understand, about marvels too great for me to know. You told me to listen while you spoke and to try to answer your questions. In the past, I knew only what others had told me, but now I have seen you with my own eyes, so I am ashamed of all I have said and repent in dust and ashes. And many people who read the book of Job, that's where they stop. Why is that? The rest of it just doesn't fit their paradigm, I guess. What do you think led to that response on the part of Job? Did, did God ever criticize Job for asking questions? He criticized the others, didn't he? Pretty much so. 
God was concerned, or uh, recognized that Job was telling the truth, and God is concerned that people t don't tell the truth about God. But also, if you read the Septuagint, uh, verse um, 8 in the Septuagint, it says, you've not told the truth about Job either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. God is concerned about Job's reputation. So, and again, I'm 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 pushing. I'm I'm trying to get us to take an overall view here. What do you think was Job? He says, "I confess in dust and ashes." What was Job confessing? Well, what God had said in chapters thirty-eight to forty-one. To Forty-one, and we were talking about it earlier before we started. Was God asked all these questions of Job? Now, where were you when I created the earth? Mm -hmm. Can you make the sun go away? Can you make the darkness go away? Can you make the separate the waters from the land? Mm -hmm. And all these things. And of course, the answer was no to any of those. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, Job kind of thought, well, yeah, I'm nothing compared to you, God. And that's why he's repenting. He certainly wasn't repenting because he had he'd said something wrong and his friends had said something right. Yeah. That's pretty clear. So Job was addressing God at that point, humbly admitting that he had raised a lot of questions earlier in the book. Did he feel that he had been too bold in his questioning of God? Was well, you think Job was too bold in his questions of God? I mean, some of the stuff he spoke out, he spoke was pretty, pretty bold, right? Compare Genesis 27, I'm sorry, 18, verse 27. Abraham, now, now here's, here's God who came with a couple of other angels and they are, um, they are approaching, they approached Abraham's house. Abraham invited them to sit down, relax, and he prepared a meal for them. Then he found out who he was talking to. The two angels went ahead and they're, what are they doing? They're on the way to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And so Abraham was negotiating with God about trying to preserve who particularly? Lot. Lot and his family, right? So Abraham spoke again. Please forgive my boldness in continuing to speak to you. Lord, I am only a man and have no right to say anything. Does that, do you think that was the attitude of, of Job? Was he, was he confessing that he had spoken too boldly? Well, there are people who, who, who say that the verses there, and, and well, l let's read this. Let's move back a few verses. You wanted to move back a little a few verses. Look at, uh, Isaiah, uh, I mean, I look at Job 42. Now let's read from verse 7. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz, I am angry with you and your two friends because you did not speak the truth about me as my servant Job did. Now take seven bulls and seven rams to Job and offer them as a sacrifice for yourselves. Job will pray for you, and I will answer his prayer and not disgrace him as you disgrace you as you deserve. You did not speak the truth about me as he did. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar did what the Lord had told them to do, and the Lord answered Job's prayer. Then after Job had prayed for his three friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had had before. Well, what did Job do that was right? Well, it says we're, right we're there. We're looking for things. He, spoken that the, he spoke the truth about God. What's that? Well, presumably it wasn't lies about God. He wasn't misrepresenting God. He was telling the truth about God. And he was a righteous and upright man. Mm -hmm. God declared that up in ch chapters 1 and 2. Yeah, but what did he do that was right? Just lived a righteous life. In mm -hmm. the ash heap? No, well, prior to that. It, at the beginning it said that he and in helped ash heap. everyone in yeah. around. He didn't walk by somebody and not try to help them. But you know, when you, you, go God to God you go to the beginning of the story, Satan said that Job was going to do something, mm -hmm. and he didn't do it. No. So maybe that's what he did right. He didn't. He didn't do what Satan wanted him to do. Well, which was what? Sin. How do you do that? How do you do that? What would he have done to make 
to say that, ah, Job sinned. He would have said, God, you did this to me. You're so it's it's probably just curse God and die, yeah. just mm -hmm. like the his wife tempted him to do. Chapter so that's cool. what he didn't do. Yeah. That's what he did right. Chapter 1, verse 8, And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Mm -hmm. Then say, answered the Lord, Does he fear God for naught? Hast thou not put a hedge about him in his house and all that he has on every side? See, this is about, book is about God's foreknowledge. Mm -hmm. God declared Job righteous. And he did it in chapters 1 and 2. And uh, most there, people... Before we run out of time here, there are some who read this book and they believe it's absolutely justification for, for retributive theology. Right. So if you're good, God will bless you. And if you're bad, God will punish you. And that's the gospel. What's wrong with that? It's a lie. It's deceptive. Mm -hmm. It's not true. Is it true that when disaster strikes is because there is or was some wrong between that person and God? No. And how about the how about uh, John the Baptist, mm -hmm. the forerunner of Jesus, when he and he ends up in prison, and un, didn't even get visited, at least mm -hmm. according to the record, and he gets his head handed uh, on a platter to. Uh, Herod's daughter. It is so easy to think that if we are good, God will bless us. By contrast, if we're bad, he will punish us. That was the theology of Job's friends. Unfortunately, it was still the theology of the scribes and Pharisees and most of the Jews in Jesus' day. What about us? What kind of thinking, uh, that kind of thinking turns God into a manipulatable deity, something like a divine Santa Claus. But we are brought up short by reading God's response in, Job's, uh, in Job 42, 7 and 8, which we just read. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz, I'm angry with you and your two friends because you did not speak the truth about me as my servant Job did. Now take seven bulls and so forth. And again, he said at the end, you did not speak the truth about me as he did. So we're going to want to focus during this study of the book of Job. What was it that Job said about God that was right? And while Job's friends were probably recovering from their shock, God essentially said, in case you did not hear me the first time, you did not speak the truth of me, about me as he did. In ancient Hebrew, things are often repeated to emphasize their importance and truth. So try to imagine yourself there, observing as Job's friends brought offerings to sacrifice and asked Job for forgiveness. You think they were serious about forgiveness? <laughs> they probably just wanted to hightail it out of there. <laughs> can, can you imagine the scene? Do you think the friends ever figured out what really happened? Did Job ever try to explain it to them? Or did they just walk away puzzled and completely stunned? Job's three daughters who are mentioned in the final chapter have beautiful names. Biblical names often have significant meanings. The facts, that they are, the facts that they are named while their brothers are not named and that they received a portion of inheritance from their father are so different from the norms of their day. What was the norm of their day? Only men are mentioned. Yes. Okay. Women are slave, essentially slaves or yes. concubines. Right. And who on, gets, only, only men get money. Who, who, yeah, who gets the inheritance? Only the men. Only the sons. Yeah. Especially, and the eldest son gets a double portion because of what? Takes care of the family. It's Take his job to take care parents. of the other uh, parents. When, 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 you know, after the other children get married and move away. Still how a lot of family from the Mideast function. Yeah. Is that, um, is that a good way to deal with things? I don't well, think so, but I might be on the wrong side if I went over there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, would you like to have your uh, retirement dependent upon some kind of fund from the Syrian government right now? Or the Iraqi government, or the Iranian government? 
Or the U.S. government. <laughs> Maybe, or even for the U.S. government. <laughs> Close to home. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you feel about starting mm. uh, our study of the book of Job at the end? Is that a good idea? Yes, we have one response. What do the rest of you think? <laughs> I was just going to say, it's different. <laughs> it's different? Yeah. How do you understand the end without knowing the beginning? Well, I, I think the reason he chose to start with the ending is he wanted to make sure that this was clearly in our mind as we read through. Because a lot of people, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people stop with, chapter 42, verse 6, and they certainly don't talk about the response of the three, how God's response to the three other people, and they don't talk about the good things that happened to Job at the end. All they're focused on is all the terrible things that happened to Job all through the book. That's all they can think about. And they don't talk much about Job 1 and 2, where no. the setting is, is placed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think probably the reason he chose to do it that way, he wants us to see that there, this, this story has bookends. We're, we're, we talked about the end first, and now we're gonna, next we're going to talk about the beginning. So this story is in a context. It's not, you know, the pieces in the middle, which most of the people know about, isn't, isn't a story that stands by itself. There's the great controversy at the beginning talked about, and there's the success of Job at the end and what he said about the three friends, etc. So these are the bookends that, that encompass this story, and it's, uh, it's, it's important to, to understand, I think, that that was a situation. And I personally am looking forward to the day when I can talk to Job uh -huh. and ask him, what in the world? What did you think? How did you feel about it? Uh, and do you think all 20 of his children will be in heaven? Hope so. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully. Why not? We'll leave that question with you. Our kind and loving Father, what a wonderful privilege it is for us to have books like the Book of Job to help us answer some of the great questions, the existential questions that people struggle with. We thank you for this privilege of starting with this lesson and then being able to follow on with the other lessons as we work our way through the book. Give us guidance that we may represent you correctly is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.